Welcome to the show, everybody. I'm yeah, Mark boy. Anthony, and I'm with my amazing co-host, the world famous Dr. Pat Basili, the street smart spiritual behavioral psychologist. And this is a very special episode of the Psychic and the Doc, reincarnation. Yep. Yeah, it's not yep. just for Hindus and Buddhists anymore. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, Pat, um, we've we've talked about this a number of times, and we've had many afterlife experts yep. and medium psychics on the show. And you know what's fascinating is reincarnation is now an openly discussed topic. You know, it used to be sort of a fringe, new agey type thing, or something that was relegated pretty much to Hindus and Buddhists. Um, but it's much more out in the open now. And I think you've probably interviewed a number of people that have um, had claims of reincarnation and past life oh, regressions. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, if you've been do if you do a show like the Dr. Patra for 20 years, and in our in in our very special guest in, in his words, something happens and you change and you are different. And then you have to kind of come out. You have to have a coming out party. And if that happens to you, then you not only interview a couple of people, but you like do a whole past regression series. You take some of the best people. They want to actually do their audio books to you. And you start to educate yourself. Yeah. But what if you actually experience this? And what if you're not the person that thinks, you know, I just ain't going to believe any of that. Uh, just that whatever you got to say, I'm just not going to listen to. But then something happens to you in your life. Right. And things change. Exactly. And it's in for many people, it's a it's an epiphany. It's that spiritual um, aha moment. But then there's other people like our guest today, where it's not just a spiritual experience but then there's evidence hard evidence yeah boy that's what i love yeah i do too um you know everything that i do as a medium is about evidential mediumship i've always taken a scientific approach and what fascinates me about our guest today who's robert snow and for 38 years he was not just a police officer but a police captain and a homicide investigator. Now, as a former prosecutor and criminal defense attorney, I can tell you this, there's few people that are more no nonsense than a police captain who is a homicide investigator. And he leaves no stone unturned, both in his work as a police officer, and he's retired now and he's a full-time author, but his work in reincarnation is just outstanding. And our guest, uh, Robert Snow, has written 15 books. The one we're going to talk about today is Portrait of a Past Life Skeptic. So I think without further ado, Dr. Pat and I uh, welcome you to the show, Robert Snow. Yeah, it's great to have you. Thank you for having me on your show. So here's what what i'm i'm fascinated is you engage in a past life regression and i want you to tell people about that you know what that is because some of our listeners may not be aware of of what that means but after you had that and you came out of it with this evidence of not just one but but a couple different prior lives you didn't just believe it you wanted to refute it so let's start first with what is a past life regression? Well, after I, after, of course, after I did that, I did a bit of study on past life regression. Basically, this is something that psychiatrists and psychologists use for someone who has a problem that medical science doesn't support. In other words, they say, I got this terrible pain in my elbow and it won't go away. And the doctors x ray it and CAT scan, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with the elbow. Quite often, doctors, as a last resort, will refer them to a past life regressionist. And what this person does is hypnotize them and reportedly take them into a past life. And almost always the first past life goes to the injury. They, they were in the civil war and they got hit by a cannonball in the elbow or what have you. And interesting enough, 
just reliving this seems to cure this, seems to cure the problem. Just reliving it during a past life will bring a cure. And so most psychologists and psychiatrists will use this only like says I'm sure, but interesting enough, I gave a speech one time after my book came out to a international uh, conference of psychologists and psychiatrists who use past life therapy. And I found that most didn't believe it was real. They yes. thought the pain or the problem is psychosomatic and so is the cure. While they used it and mostly took his person back, most of them until I heard till I gave the speech there didn't really believe it was real. They believed again it gets it's something all this is all in their mind. And they but but they use past life regression therapy because it works. It works, it's quite successful. And so they used it even though most of them didn't believe there actually was a past life, only that it would lead what they did would lead to a cure. Yeah. You know, I, I'm so glad you said that. Because being in that group of people, I will verify that what you just said is absolutely true. And I have to tell you, when I broke out and did the show, uh, I got banned from my college, my doctoral college. Now, why would that be? How does somebody get blacklisted from a school, somebody whose dissertation won awards and then research? What do you have to do to become a pariah in, 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 in the view of the people you're around. Now, I'm not going to tell my story because I can't imagine for you that you said, yes, my uncle was a police chief and I know what happened to him when he came out of the box a little bit, right? I want to know what happened to you before you decided to get the past life regression because you're entering a field now, right? where you are going to be talking, you're going to be saying some stuff, you're going to be doing some things that probably in your profession, and even in mine as a psychologist, that's going to seem a little different. What was that like for you? And Minnie, my question is, what the heck got you to get to the past life regression? Well, you know, actually, I was a police officer for 38 years. Yeah. I was there a long time. But, you know, I never really wanted to be a police officer. Never, <laughs> never occurred to me as a little kid. When people ask me, I was four or five, what I wanted to be, I'd always say I wanted to be a writer. And, of course, people in those days, that's like saying, when they patch on the head and say, well, that's, that's nice. But I always, all I ever wanted to be was a writer my whole life. But anyway, I was in the uh, military during the Vietnam War. And once I had served my time, I was discharged. I got out. And I need a job. So my brother had been a, had joined the police department by a year for that, and he said, "Well, hey, come on down." I said they're desperate because they're you know all the men, the able-bodied men most are in Vietnam or in the military somewhere. So I went down and I applied, and I, and it turned out to be a very fortuitous thing because the job not only was the job a good job, it paid pretty well with good benefits, but it just gave you mountains of evidence. Mountains, mountains of information and evidence to use as a writer. I mean, because I actually, uh, the introduction said I'd written 15 books. That's an old one. I've actually written 20 books. Yeah. And all but all but this book I, I'm talking about tonight have been about police work, about SWAT teams, about self protection, about uh, homicide investigation, what have you. So uh, joining the police department become very, was a very fortuitous chance for me, but I never wanted to. But I always want to be a writer. But think about being a writer is you just don't write you have to read you have to read beside being a writer you have to read read a lot and not just from your field you need to write read from every field because if you see a passage that boy this worked really great you want to analyze it and say what does this writer do to make this sound so good and likewise you can find a passage this is really bad and you want to make sure you don't do the same thing so i've always been a very very a big reader and so i belonged to a number of book clubs but one time my book club had a book that was called coming back by dr raymond moody and i ordered it It sounded kind of interesting i ordered it and it's actually dr moody's a very good writer it was really well done he talks about he had a friend actually dr moody before this had done investigation and near-death experiences and either his psychologist friend did past life regression therapy and she wanted him to undergo it to see what it like so he did it and he went to anchor past lives and all that. And it was a really well written book, very colorful book describing his past lives. But at the very end, he kind of hedges and says, Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if this is real. I think it might just be my imagination. And that's how I felt when I finished the book. Like, this sounds nice. It's a, it's a fight of, flight of fancy by someone who wants to, you know, imagine things. And 
what have you. And at the time, I thought any people who believed reincarnation were just people who wanted to blame their troubles in this life on something else. In other words, they say, well, I'm such a loser in this life, but that's because of a past life, something I did in a past life type thing. And I thought it was just, it's just, it was just people wanting to believe. I didn't believe it was, you know, it was true at all. You know, I thought it was just people who wanted to moan and complain, but have something to blame it on. So anyway, I read the book and I went on to other books. But a couple months later, I was at a party and I was talking to a lady, uh, Kathy Graben. Kathy was not only a child abuse detective, but she was also a practicing psychologist. She did both jobs at once at the same time. But anyway, we were making small talk about movies she'd seen, television programs. We go around to books, and I remembered this book. And I mentioned to Kathy that I'd read the book. And now, at this time, I didn't know that Kathy used past life regression therapy in her practice. But anyway, she asked me what I thought about the book, and I told her I thought how, how silly it was. I thought it was kind of goofy. It's just goofy people wanting to you know, blame a blame bad misfortune on anything but themselves. And I, it was kind of late in the party, and I had a bit to drink, and I think I was kind of obnoxious. Making, I was kind of making fun of reincarnation to her. Well, I got, it got to the point where Kathy, I, I got to the point, she said, well, if you think it's so goofy, why don't you try it? Tell me. So tell me. And so you try it yourself, and then tell me it's goofy. And at first I said, no, I'm not going to do that. You know, silly. But finally, if I got the point, oh, you're scared. Now you don't want to ask a man, or if he's scared, he's, of course, you're going to deny it. So eventually I end up saying, I end up agreeing to do it. And she, so she gave me a card to a friend of hers who did the past our regression therapy, a, a Dr. Melia Ellen Griffith. And she says, well, you make a point with Dr. Griffith, do it. Then come back and tell me how silly it is. And I, again, I, it was late in the party. I'd had a bit of drink, so I agreed to it. Well, the next day, you know, much more, much more alert and sober, I said, I'm not doing this. That's stupid. But it seemed like from that day on, I would run to Kathy at least once or twice a day. Before this, I would see her maybe once a month. But it seemed like every day I would see her, and she'd say, have you made the appointment yet? And I, I would make up some flimsy excuse of why I hadn't called Dr. Griffith. I'd say, well, you know, I had three meetings and reports and everything. But it seemed like after this, I'd see her every day. There she'd be. And you get to the point, I'd say, oh, God, I hope she didn't see me first. I'd want to get out of there before she, I saw before she saw me. Like I could eventually, so finally, I got tired of this thing. She'd catch me in the hallway and ask me, and I got so tired of making excuses. I was, I was kind of irritated by that time, by the whole thing. So I finally decided, well, what I'm going to do, I'm going to make the appointment with Dr. Griffith. I'm going to go there. I'm going to cooperate 100% with whatever Dr. Griffith wants me to do. Then I'm going to show Kathy how, how silly it is. I was even going to take my own tape recorder along. I wanted to tape it for Kathy so I could show her just how goofy this, how, how goofy all this stuff was. So I did. I called Dr. Griffith and made, made the appointment to go see her. And you know what's um, funny? Is it talking about Dr. Moody, I actually uh, spoke with him yesterday. I was uh, he interviewed me on his Life After Life podcast, and he brought up an interesting point. Like he will say, "Well, I did this," but then he always leaves the door open. You know, Dr. Moody's very, um, I think, skillful, very good about not committing himself because we were talking about um, about spirit communication, and he said that. You know, we always have to leave different possibilities. So it's it's fascinating um, um, what you were saying about you. You know, you finally got persuaded to do this. Now, um, obviously, you did, and something happened which rocked your world. Yeah, I, so I, I went. To, I went to see Dr. Griffiths, a very very nice woman, very very polite, very nice. And of course, she asked me, you know. Did I have some problems I wanted to work out, whatever? And I told her, no, I just thought that past life uh, regression was interesting. I wanted to try it. She had no problem at all. So she said, she said, she said, she had a couch. And she looked like a, what I thought a psychiatrist or psychologist looked like. She had an old wooden desk and a couch and all that. So anyway, I sat down on the couch and she's, and we just started talking. And she asked me to various, to, to describe in, in big detail various parts of my life. It, about she talked about my college graduation, something happened in high school, grade school, you know, so on. And I could see what she's doing. Going, she wasn't a terribly good interrogator because I could see she was moving toward the, <laughs> the past, the past. So anyway, she finally, she finally said, "Okay, let's get started. Close your eyes, okay? And can you see a balloon?" Now I was sitting on the couch. I wasn't going to lay down. I was. I thought that that was a little much. But I, I sat on the couch, and to my right there was a window, so I could see a, a purple blob of my eyelids, which of course I knew was the sun coming through the window. And I told her, "Yeah, I can see a purple balloon." She said, "Okay." I said, "Now I want you to imagine. Just imagine this: that you're climbing into the balloon and going up. 
Okay, so again, I had I had told myself I'm going to do everything she asked me to do. I'm not cooperate 100% so I can show her, show Kathy how stupid and foolish all this is. So anyway, so I did. So I, I matched myself getting in the blue and going up. And it's interesting. I th when I was looking when I was there, it looked like the bottom of my eyelids. I could see little points of light below, but I just I just pointed brushed that off as I figured that was just reflection off the floor. Well, anyway, we're anyway. So finally, she said, "Okay, now take the balloon down." Said, "There's a imagine yourself taking it down." Said, "There's a control up over your head. Pull it and go down." Well, nothing happened. And again, I was thinking to myself, "This is her daydream, not mine." That's why. And we went through this at least a dozen, at least a dozen times. She said, "Okay, take a little further. Now go down." And nothing happened. And it was at least a dozen times. She was so very gracious. No, no problem. I, I was worried. I was thinking she's probably really aggravated by now. And I was getting to think myself, ah, this is what happens. You're what the pleads the psychologist. You know, after this many times, you know, she's, she's irritated at you. This is what happened. People make stuff up. So why? She said, OK. She said, OK, obviously, it's not places places you don't want to go to. She says, now, see in your mind if you can imagine a mountain. So I tried in my mind, imagine a mountain in it, and I could see a mountain in my mind, you know, trying to imagine it for it. She said, okay, now take the balloon and land on the mountain. And interesting enough, I could land the balloon on the mountain. She said, okay, there's a log cap here. Can you see it? And interesting enough, I could see a blurry, it wasn't clear or anything. It was kind of a blurry imagination type thing, a log cabin. But interesting enough, the logs are going vertically rather than horizontal. And one of my readers later told me that that was a French way of building uh, log cabins. But anyway, she said, okay, now go into the cabin, tell me what you see. I didn't see anything. Again, this is her daydream, not mine. So she said, okay, imagine a meal and, you know, imagine you're here of the warmth in the meal. And so I'm doing that. I'm getting, I'm trying to cooperate. So she said, okay, now we're going to leave the cabin. We're going to walk down. There's a valley here. We're going to walk down the valley. She said, I want you to go back to the very, the very first life you lived on earth. Okay, go back to Rayford. I'm thinking, oh boy, this is stupid. This is, I'm thinking to myself, this is Bob, you, this is really stupid. You have got yourself sucked into doing something ridiculous. So he said, I'm going to count the steps as we go down. She said, okay, there's 12 steps. So she starts counting. She says, 12, 11, and her voice is getting longer. You know, 10, and a little, the, way, the, the, word, the numbers are going out longer. I'm thinking, oh God, this is like a, you know, a stage hypnotist thing. I thought this is not going to work. But anyway, when she got to one, something really bizarre happened. All of a sudden, I was in a valley. I mean, I didn't, I wasn't imagining I was in a valley. I wasn't dreaming I was in a valley. I was in a valley. Now, I knew I was still sitting in her office. I could feel the couch. And I could hear noise in the street. At the same time, I was in a valley. Now, I wasn't real stupid. I knew what happened. I figured, even though I didn't think I could be hypnotized, I figured I was much too strong. I realized I had been hypnotized because I was in a valley. And it wasn't just a blurry, just an image of a valley. I could, I could feel, I could hear birds from the trees nearby. If I looked, I could see the veins on leaves on the bushes. I was walking, I was walking through this valley next to a little creek. All right, so hold on, hold on, that. hold on. All right, so is this a visual account? I, I wasn't sure because did you feel, in other words, were you, are you, were you reporting on what you were seeing or did you actually feel that you were there? That's the interesting part. I could feel a breeze in my face. And wow. I could, because I could see yeah. the leaves move, I could see the leaves moving. But I, I wrote that off as Bob. That's just the air conditioning in the office. You're, you've yeah. always been hypnotized. You've always been hypnotized. But you know what I thought this was? This is kind of like you go to Disney World, other amusement parks. They have virtual reality, <laughs> virtual reality rides that are very. I mean, they're very lifelike. I mean, and they're very believable. But you know, it's not true. You know, it's virtual reality. And I assume that's this is just under hypnosis. This looks real. I mean. The clarity, what's, what really stunned me mostly was the clarity of it. Yeah. it was, I mean, again, I could see the veins and leaves. I could, I could feel a breeze in my face. I could hear birds chirping. And I'm walking along the brook, and Dr. Griffiths said, okay, look down and describe yourself. So I look down, and I see I have a couple of really dirty, hairy legs, and I'm wearing some, uh, some really dirty, matted fur. And in my left hand, I'm carrying what looks like a big piece of a tree limb. Now, everybody's seen movies and books. I knew this is, I'm supposed to be a caveman. I mean, everybody, but everybody's seen movies and books and TV programs. And, what, and I thought, again, this is just hypnosis. You know, tell me, just tell me, I'll make me see this. It's not really true. But then as I walk along, suddenly I can, I can see, I can realize the thoughts that the person is having, the person's body I'm in. I can realize his, his thoughts. And, he, and then all of a sudden, I'm aware this is Valley's my home. This is where I live. And even stranger, I started saying things. 
I didn't know what I was going to say. Usually in, in real life, you have a, uh, at least a half second before you say something, you know what you're going to say. Well, this case, I was just blurting out stuff and I had no idea I was going to say it. I said, this is my home. I live here. I live in a cave up on the hill here. So Dr. Chris said, okay. He says, I want you to go to the cave. So I went to the cave and as I stood at the door of the cave, I could tell whoever lived here was not very hygienic. God, it was an awful stench. I walked the cave. Now that really confused me for a moment. I, you know, I, I was talking about the, the breeze of the air conditioner. I couldn't imagine where the smell come from. It was the smell of a person who had been very unhygienic. So I described everything, Dr. Griffin. She said, okay, now I want you to go to your death. She says, go to your death and tell me what you see. So you see, between this, there's probably about four or five seconds, it's kind of a gray fog. I, you could, I couldn't see anything. And all of a sudden, I'm back in a body, but I'm not in a body this time. I'm floating above. I'm about mm -hmm. 10 feet above. And on the cave floor is a little bit skinny man in fur, and he's coughing and hacking. He looks, he looks really, really sick. And Dr. Greer said, okay. He says, so what, you know, says, what did you learn from this, this life? And I said, I have, and again, I'm just blurting this out. I have no idea what's going to say this. So I had to learn about loneliness. I had to learn what it's like to live without anyone. Mm. Again, I'm just stunned myself. I'm saying this because I didn't know what's going to say it. She said, now go out of the cave and see if you can see a light. And I'd go to the cave, and sure enough, there's a big light over the valley. She says, now, so I want you to go into the light, and I want you to go into a life where you had someone, where you actually, you weren't lonely, where you had someone. And I'm, and again, this is all, to me, again, this is like, again, I'm not, this is not, I'm not serious. I didn't think this was real. I just, I just, I just didn't believe that hypnosis could be this vivid. And I, I, again, I figured this is like a ride at Disney World. And I was really kind of enjoying it. Because it was, it was, it was fun. But I knew it wasn't true, but it was fun. So anyway, I fly into the light, and again, there's oh, four or five seconds, and four or five. I, actually, people who are old enough remember in the old days you'd have you go to a movie theater. Sometimes the movie would be all blurry when it started. It's yeah. Just yeah. Snap into focus. Right. Snap right. into focus. Well, that's what this was. Everything was blurry. I could see vague outlines all the time, blurry, and I was on a city street, and it was sunny, and I could feel that sun beating down on me, the heat of the sun, and I look around, and I can see gas lights and horse-drawn carriages. Now I'm describing all this to Dr. Griffith. And I said, she said, what do they think is this? She said, I said, it looks like the 1800s because there are no automobiles, but there are a lot of horse-drawn carriages and gas lights on the street. She says, okay, what are you doing? I said, I'm going to meet a woman. Okay, she asked me, she said, describe yourself. So I looked down, I had a very nice suit on and clothes. I said, I also have a cane. And she said, a cane? I said, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not crippled or anything. It's a fancy walking stick. She said, okay. So then what are you going to do? So I, you meet the woman, what do you do? I said, we go to an outdoor cafe and she orders a glass of some kind of special water and I order a glass of wine. So I, we just talked this a minute and she said, okay, now go five years ahead in your life. So again, there's four or five seconds of gray fog and I'm in this hallway with a woman and we're having a really vigorous argument. I mean, this woman are having a vigorous argument and I find just get mad and leave and walk away. And I go down the hallway and I walk into a room and it's an artist studio. The doctor said, extract the root to me. I said, the ceiling is skylights, and the right wall, the white wall is all windows. I said, there are, and there are dozens of painter, that are paintings hanging around, hanging on the wall, just dozens of unsold paintings hanging on the wall. And again, then, like with the caveman, I suddenly could feel what this person felt, know what he had near thought. And I knew I was an artist. She said, okay. So we described all that to me. She said, okay, I go five years ahead. So again, I went five years and I'm at a party and I don't know what the party's about, only that I'm the guest of honor. Everyone's congratulate me and pat me on the back and shake my hand. And anyway, I could tell, feel this person was at a moment of immense happiness for this person. This person just felt so good. So I described all their grips. She said, okay, now God, I want you to sit. I want you to, to go to your death. She says, go to your death and tell me. But I didn't. I didn't leave. I, could you think about in your life, would you have moments like that when you just feel such intense happiness? Maybe your marriage, first marriage, yeah. the birth of your first child. It really was a good feeling. It really was nice. So I, she had told me three or four times before I would finally, before I finally left. And that's the other thing, probably hypnosis. People see these things like where they got, he, that you're, you know, that the hypnosis makes you cluck like a chicken or stuff like that. That's not true. I do. I was in complete control of myself. I could do whatever. Again, Dr. Gave kept telling me, move on five years. Move on. You know, actually told me, move on to your death. And I didn't. I stayed at the party for a while. Finally, I, I did. I said, I go to my death. And I see I'm laying on the bed here and I'm dying. 
And the doctor, and the doctor said, okay, what did you regret about this? What did you regret about this life? Mm -hmm. I said, I regret we didn't have children because my wife couldn't have children. So then I saw myself rise up out of the body and go through the roof of this building. They are by seeing ghost stories on movies and TV. They are by those what ghosts do. Of course they do that. They rise up. But anyway, I rose up through the, the ceiling of this building and I'm over a huge, huge city. There's lights in every direction to the horizon. I'm over a huge city. And Dr. said, okay. He says, now go into the light. But I didn't again. Again, all of a sudden I see myself flying through some woods. And I, it, looked, it looked like a fall night because it was, it was like a brisk cold night, but the, the trees still had leaves on them. So I figured it was a fall night. And next thing I know, I'm on the second or third floor of this mansion. And I'm looking in the window. It's a room. There's a big roaring fire in the room. Nobody's in the room. There's a big roaring fire. And over this over the fireplace is a painting. And it's a still life. It has fruit and a bottle and a big sun in it. And I, I told Dr. Griffith, I wanted to see one of my paintings before I left Earth. I wanted to see my one of my paintings one more time. So finally, Dr. Griffith said, okay, now, so let's go into the light again. And I want you to, to go to a life as a, you had as a female. And I, I remember laughing myself. Said, yeah, that's going to happen. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Well, sure enough, it did. That's about, that, about five seconds of gray fog again. I mean, I'm in another wooded area, but it's not the valley. It's flat, and the trees are all different. And I'm standing in front of this bill. It's this. It's like an altar. It's like a circular altar with real tall pillars around it. And I look down. I can see I'm in a woman's body. And I'm thinking, boy, you know, that, that kind of shook me up a little bit. I'm thinking, now, where could you, where could you imagine this from? And I'm thinking, well, maybe, you saw, maybe there's movies about people being transferred to another body. And I'm thinking, you probably, this is just your subconscious mind bring up bits of old movies about this sort of thing. You're doing it. Then, but then again, like the other two uh, lives, I can suddenly realize what this person is thinking. And she, she's basically thinking that this is where she loves. This is where she lives. This is where she works. Her and other girls bring things down to the altar. They, that's their job. They bring things, put them on the altar. And I told Dr. Griffith, yeah, we're all young, pretty girls. We're all virgins. That's part of the requirement to do this. So, Doctor, if we describe describe the uh, altar tour and what have you, she said, "Okay." And I go five years forward. So again, I go five years forward, and when I come out of the fog, I'm in a like a cart, like a wagon, it's pulled by oxen. And next to me on my right is an old, old, older man. And again, I knew what this person knew that obviously that I had been given to this man. That he had given me because when I looked to my right, there was a little girl sitting there who I knew was my daughter. So obviously I wasn't a virgin any longer, so I probably I couldn't work at the altar anymore. But the interesting part was this wasn't anybody. It looked it was actually my stepdaughter from my this life. Oh wow! Can, can I ask a question? What is is your interpretation of that? Is your interpretation that she was with you in that life as well as this life, and that your two prior lives and your current lives intersected, or? Do you think, you know, being the skeptic and being the investigator, do you think that your brain may have been filling in the blanks of, of when you sensed a little girl sitting next to you? What is your belief? At the time, I didn't think it was anything. At the time, right. I thought this is just, just my subconscious mind playing tricks on me. The right. interesting part, the little girl sitting there wasn't the girl I'd seen that day off the high school. Uh, she was, by the time I had a regression, she was a 16, 17 in high school. This was the little four-year-old girl she had been when her mother and I got married. So anyway, we got, and I didn't really tell you the truth. I didn't, at that time, I didn't think anything. I, because to me, this is all just dream stuff. My subconscious mind. Right, but, that. but in the, the reflection afterwards, what do you think? Well, I, I think I, she, I, I'm sorry, go ahead. I, I think really, so, so for me, when I'm listening to you, you're, it's so fascinating the way you're describing this, because I love that both the skeptic, skeptic, and the reality of what was happening is coming through your voice right now. You, you have a brilliant way to talk about this, of your experience, what you've experienced from both sides of reality. And that, I got to tell you, uh, that is very rare. But the way you're doing it, it's very clear to me that some part of you literally had your left brain logically justifying why you're feeling the lead. But yet there was a part of you that surrendered or you wouldn't have been able to continue with it. And, you know, it's fascinating to hear you in the way you're mm -hmm. describing it, because here's what I'm struck, struck by in a minute. And, and then I want you to finish the story because this is like so fascinating to me. It's incredible. 
it is real. And if you're me and you've done these with people, how do you know whether or not what you're hearing? Well, it's interesting because you go through the process and somebody wakes up and part of what their past life was, uh, was being caught in a rain and a down, downpour and they wake up and they ask you for a towel and they're sitting right across from you. But what I love about this and the way you do it in your books as well and the way you tell this story is you're helping a lot of people maybe take that step where they're going to be skeptical, but they're going to take action because there's so many people that don't understand things. You know, if you came in my house now, you'd see more Egyptian artifacts. And I became completely obsessed with them. But the way you're describing this and the way you do it in your book, it helps people help them understand they're not crazy, Robert. So come, please finish, please finish your story. I just want to remind our listeners, though, that if you don't know what you're listening to, it's a psychic and the doc. And we have a very, very special guest today, Robert Snow. And what Mark alluded to before is one of the many things he's written is portrait of a past life um, skeptic, right? right? But when you read this, and hopefully you guys will get to the end, there's something at the end of his book that makes sense about everything he's talking about and why maybe he, like me, why spending that time in the police force might've been part of that journey. Go ahead, Robert. Well, at the, again, at the time, I, I just thought this is part of hypnosis against seeing my stepdaughter. <laughs> but interesting enough, she, when I, when I wrote the book and talked to her about it, she knew things about my regression. She knew things about the, the, one of the people in my regression that, yeah. There was this recorded anywhere that anybody would find. I thought that was kind of interesting she, that she uh -huh. she did know some facts that weren't really recording where. So anyway, okay. uh, I go yep, to the farm. There you with go. This <laughs> yeah, I go to the, I go to the farm with this man. He dies real soon afterwards, and so I'm here. I am with the little four or five year old daughter. So what I did I took her back to the altar and gave her to the people at the altar that so that she could be able to have the same job I had and everything. And I'm telling myself as I'm talking to Dark Griffith, that this is the best thing for her. This is wonderful. She'll have a great life. But what I'm feeling inside, not myself, but this person I'm in is tremendous guilt because I know what I'm doing is abandoning my daughter. I'm actually giving her away because I know life would be a lot easier for me if I didn't have a little five-year-old girl tagging along. And all of a sudden, it was really funny because I thought how silly this was when I was doing, if they're doing, doing the regression. I felt this terrible pressure on me of guilt. It was like I felt awful, like a brick's laying on my chest. I felt so awful. But I'd done this. I kept telling her over and over, this is for her, but this is the best thing for her. This is good and all this. I didn't believe it. I knew what I was doing was banning her. So anyway, Dr. Griffith went on. She said, okay, now go to your death in this life. And I had apparently gone to a someplace close to the ocean or and because there was I was in a fish, I was I was doing something in the fishing industry. And in my death, I was in the water. And I was, my, my legs were caught up in some kind of net and I was drowning. And for just a moment, I could taste salt water. For wow. just a moment, Dr. Griffiths, I was like, taste salt water. And so finally, Dr. Griffiths said, okay, now I'll go into the light. And boy, I, I wanted to get the light fast on this one because I felt this terrible, the whole time, terrible, oppressive guilt for what I'd done with my daughter. So I went into the light. She said, okay, now go to your most previous life before you were Bob Snow. Go to the very most previous past life you were in before your present one. So again, there was four or five seconds fog, and all of a sudden I'm back, I can tell, I'm back in the artist's body again. But now I'm in my studio and I'm painting a portrait. But the interesting part was that the woman, the person who I was painting up for that was, to pay, pay a portrait of a hunchback. So anyway, but the interesting part is, I again, this, this, the thing, the regression is so clear, I could see every single brush stroke in this painting. And I could tell I was just about finished. And I talked to Dildorf Griffiths. I said, I, I hate painting portraits. I don't like painting, I hate doing them, but I need the money. I really need the money. I could feel this person's desperate need for money. I, th I just kept saying, I need the money. I hate painting portraits, I need the money. So Dr. we talked about the bin. Dr. Griffiths said, okay. 
go five years ahead in your life and tell me what you see. And so I go five, I go five years and I see a, a uh, I'm in a vigorous argument with someone about the lighting for one of my paintings, that the lighting isn't right. I'm just having a big argument with him. So anyway, Dr. said, okay, now to see. And if I, if I go in five years and I'm in a, a small garden and I hear music, piano music coming from a, from a house close by. So I walk up to the house down around. Dr. Griffith asked me, where are you at? And for, I just immediately blurred out. I didn't know what I was going to say. I said, I'm in France. And again, I didn't know what I was going to say. It. Dr. Griffith said, okay, now go five years forward. So in the, so in the fog, before I could get to the next five years, I suddenly blurted out. She died of a blood clot. The doctor said she died of a blood clot. Now, I had no idea who I was talking about, only that whoever this person was, I could feel the grief this person felt, the sadness. That this was a person who was very, very important to this, the artist. Some woman who had died was very important. I kept saying she died of a blood clot. Well, before I get to the next scene, the recorder I'd brought along, I wanted to tape all this so I could show Kathy how stupid it was. Uh, the, the recording I brought along clicked off and opened my eyes, and that was it. It was over. Mm. Now I'm I'm kind of embarrassed, to tell you the truth, only because I'd gone there with these the ideas of how stupid those was and nothing would happen. And I've had is a, I mean again I didn't believe it was real at the moment, but I know I've been blabbering like an idiot for about a half hour about things <laughs> to see that I, I knew were just the hypnosis. So Doc Griffith asked me, he says, Well, can you see how this relates to your present life and all that? And I really couldn't at the moment. I was too too confused and flustered by what had happened. So I I, I forget my mumble something to her and went out to my car. I didn't leave right away. I sat in my car for a while trying to understand what had just happened. The, the problem with the whole thing wasn't the the what happened, the trance that was the regression, but how vivid it had been. Yeah. I mean, I could not only see and hear, I could feel, I could smell, and I could touch, I could taste things. Yeah. And that, to me, that I don't know how that could, I thought the tip notes must have been really, really strong to make you do that, to imagine myself doing that. And I sat there for about a half an hour trying to figure out what it meant. And then finally I told myself, Bob, this is nothing. It was just hypnosis. You had brought up a bunch of memories for your path from your subconscious mind, and that's all there was to it. Let it forget about it. Just it was a fun. It was a fun. Interesting. It was fun. It was. It was kind of fun. It was like again, you know, like a great ride at some amusement park. But just forget about it. <laughs> well, that sound. That that sounds good. But I couldn't stop thinking about this. Right. And interesting, for the first couple of years after my regression, if I closed my eyes, I could still see the scenes in, in, in vivid detail. I could, if I closed my eyes, I could still see the painting, the brush strokes in the painting. It was just a fruit on. So I kept telling myself, tell myself, Bob, forget about it. It was nothing. It was just hypnosis. Bring up some memories. But I couldn't. Yeah. I thought about it 50, 100 times a day, every day. I thought I'd close my eyes and I'd see it. I just thought about it constantly, just constantly. And I knew I was becoming obsessed. I tell you, I was a police officer for 38 years, and I know when you have some kind of people who have deep obsession, it seldom turns out real well for you. That doesn't really turn out real well. So I finally said, well, you know, this is crazy, Bob. You can't let yourself be obsessed like this. You got to do something about it. I said, what I need to do, I need to find one of these paintings, either the still life or the fireplace or the hunchback woman. I thought if I could find one of these paintings, it was all of a sudden, oh, yeah, I saw that, you know, five years ago someplace. And there was a little blur about the artist at the bottom. That's how I know these things. I was sure that's what it was. So I thought, well, the way to do it, I got to find one of these paintings. So I made a plan that I would go to the public library. Now, this was this, hap this happened before the, the event of the Internet. Yeah, so that's right. There was, yeah. there was no search engine. No no. Search engine. No. You could just put a portrait of a hunchback woman in. So right. in those days, when you went to I don't mean to laugh, but you had to go to the library. Yeah, it's like you may yeah. even had to go on microfilm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I totally had, relate to that. Yeah, I mean that that is so unique and unusual. Yeah, because um, uh, and, you know you would think that it, you would be envisioning yourself as being like a Leonardo or a Raphael painting the Mona Lisa, not some guy I can't identify painting a hunchback. You know, I mean, that really is unique. But it's very real. I mean, yeah. so real, so real, Bob, that you could not, not find it. You could not, not research it. What I'm trying I to had, say, I had to because I, 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 could, I couldn't stop thinking about it. I think about it. it. It just it was occupying my, my thoughts constantly. All the time. So I thought, I thought, <laughs> if I could find these paintings, I'll remember where I saw them at. Then it'll, it'll all fall in place. You saw it this at this exhibit. You yeah. you read the blurb of the artist. That's how it all come yeah. true. 
So I decided I'd go to the Indianapolis Public Library. Again, there's no internet, so I'd go to the library. I'd go through their art books till I found it. Well, that was a good plan, but let me tell you, I had no idea there were so many. There were hundreds of art books in the library. And I spent months, but I went through every single book. Mm. Couldn't find either painting. Now, that kind of confused me, because I, not, not because maybe I thought I'd imagine, because it, I thought it was, it, the painting was just too clear in my mind. I mean, again, I, I could see every single brushstroke that it couldn't be, it couldn't be real. And I couldn't understand what happened. So I just started, started visiting a couple of some bookstores right in Annapolis, the Barnes and Noble and the, the various books. And I thought they had art books in the library. And I went through all those. And again, it took me a couple of months. I still didn't find it. Now I'm getting flustered now because I know they, I, there has to be somewhere. So I, what, I decided, what I did, I started calling art galleries around Annapolis and asked them if they knew where it was. Mm. At that time, I found before the internet, there was no central registry of paintings. Now, if you wanted a Rembrandt or a Renoir, yeah, you could find that. They knew where that was at. But small paintings like this, and everybody told me the same thing. If you don't know where it's at or who might have, who might know where it's at, you're never yeah. going to find it. That's so, right. right. But I wasn't ready to. I wasn't ready to give up yet. I've been an investigator for a long. I wasn't ready to give up yet. I thought maybe I need to pull back and try some other tactic. So what I did, I went to a New Age bookstore in Annapolis and bought a couple of books on past life regression therapy. I thought maybe if I understood what happened <laughs> during the session. Then I would then make it clear to what you know why we actually what happens. Uh, I explained what I'd seen, so <laughs> I read them and I was amazed that I learned how many people had experienced things similar to what I experienced. But more than that, one of the books had a script for self hypnosis. It looked sound like a lot like Dr. Griffith, a lot of imagery and everything. Yeah. So I tried it. Let me tell you something. That's a lot harder than you think it is. The self hypnosis is a lot harder than you think. But I'd probably died a dozen times, and only two of the times. I could feel myself going into the same state that had been Dr. Griffith's office, but it only lasts for two or three seconds. I would see the number 1917, then it'd, it'd like snap off. It happened to me twice. So finally, I decided, well, Bob, when I was in charge of homicide, we had an 83% clearance rate, which is really good for a big city. But that still means every year, 17% of the murders go unsolved. Simply, they go unsolved if we don't have enough evidence, most. And I figured that's, that's what's happened in this case. I don't have any more. I've checked every line I could think of. So what we do with the murder cases, when you do that, you deactivate them. They go on the shelf. You don't really do any more work on them, but you will. They're ready to be re reactivated if you have new evidence to come up. So I said, Bob, you can't solve it. You look at every avenue. There's nothing you do. Just forget about it, which sounds good, but it didn't work. I still was obsessed about it. But anyway, it was getting toward uh, April of the year and my wife and I's anniversary last April. And we decided to go to a vacation somewhere we'd never been before. So one day I'm at work and she calls me. My wife, by the way, was a police officer also. She was a she was a child abuse detective along with Kathy Grave, and that's how I, I met Kathy Grave at the party because was, my wife was also a child abuse detective for many years. So she called me and said, "What about New Orleans? Let's go to New Orleans." Mm -hmm. I thought that's like fun. I'd never been to New Orleans. Did you? It sounded like fun. So we planned. We got the hotel, got a plane ride in a hotel, went down to New Orleans. Now my wife is a real history buff. Now you go to New Orleans, you can't throw a rock without hitting something historical. And we did a lot of days. We visited plantation after plantation, the, the battlefield, 1812, what have you. And at nighttime, we go down to the French Quarter and have a drink, a couple of drinks, and listen to music and everything. But I noticed as we went down to the French Quarter, there were all kind of really neat shops in the French Quarter, of uh, uh, antique shops, memorabilia shops, what have you, that were always closed when we went down to the French Quarter. So the, our last day there, our plane didn't leave till the evening. And I said, well, let's spend the day. We'll go window shopping in the French Quarter. And that, that's like a fun idea to kind of you know, they kind of, kind of give you give day something to do that day. So we did. We went to a lot of antique stores, went to memorabilia stores, and we finally got to Royal Street. Now, Royal Street, New Orleans at this time was all art galleries. Mm -hmm. That was fun. We we started to have, they had some beautiful paintings by some people I knew. I'm not, I don't know much about art. I'm not an artificial. I don't know, really <laughs> know much about it, but I recognize these people. They are famous enough. I recognize. But I noticed that we walked down Royal Street, the galleries are getting smaller and the painters more obscure. We finally get to the end of or of uh, Royal Street, and there's a low art gallery, this two-story gallery. And we walk in the front door. It said Modern Art Upstairs. My wife is a fan. I've never have been. I, I always think it's junk art, but I don't have. I'm not. I'm not an art aficionado, so I can't really say for sure. But I never cared for modern art. So she went upstairs, and I was walking along the the first floor, and there's paintings, and I don't recognize any of the paintings, recognize any of the artists. I'm walking along, and I get to the corner. There's a portrait standing on the easel, and I walk by and give it a glance. And I stopped like I ran into a glass wall. I just froze. Wow. I turned around and looked. It was the portrait of the hunchback woman. 
Oh, I'm going to tell you something. In 38 years in the police department, I was in a lot of frightening, scary situations, a lot of them. But when you're in scary situations in the police force, you have training and experience to fall back on. You know what you should do and what, what, what your best procedure should be. In this case, I had nothing to fall back on. I just, I, I just, I didn't know what to do. I, I just look and there's the pain. Need you search just stumble on onto it by accident in New Orleans. They're not. They're it's, it's impossible. And I'm telling myself, I'm trying to I'm trying to rationalize this because I'm really I'm I'm frightened. I'm really frightened because I I don't think this is reality. Something's wrong. I'm I'm I'm, I'm kind of going with the idea of maybe I'm not here. I, I'm in a nursing home or a hospital. And with, because things like this happen in you know movies and books, they don't happen in real life. I'm sorry, they just do not happen to people. And I'm trying to figure out what could, how could this be. And I thought, well, maybe what is this is not the painting. It looks like a painting. It looks like it's not. But again, like I, said, I closed my eyes, I could see a brush stroke, and I knew this was. I didn't know what to do. Wow. I'm just standing, look at this thing, and thinking, how can this? be how can this be it's not possible but it but but it, then but you knew it, finally, it was I'm real standing look at this thing for four or five minutes I, well, the, the salesman for says gee i bet you're thinking how nice i look over your fireplace and i'm i'm thinking yeah i'm decorating yeah. an early well, hunchback. I want a picture of a hunchback woman. <laughs> That's the artist. Who, yeah yeah who's the who's the artist on this so he said well come over, my dad, come over here i have a little bio of him so he had took him over. Hmm. Over to his desk, over to the desk, pulled out his name was Jay Carroll Beckwith. And I started looking at the uh, the, pay, the uh, bio, and I saw immediately five things about Beckwith I had seen in the regression. For one thing, one thing there, that there actually was a portrait of a hunchback woman. That they, and of course, when I say what his date of birth and death, he was born in 1852, he died in 1917. I remember my self hypnosis at 1917. Yeah. And also that he also that he had lived during a time when I had seen the regression during the late the, he was he had lived during the 1800s early 1900s a time where there would have been carriages and gas lights, and that he had spent some time in France. And I remember telling Dark Griffith that oh. we were in France, and that he had won a number of awards for his painting. And I again recalled the scene where I was at a party and everybody was congratulating me. But again, I thought Bob, come on, this is just silly that you've seen this you've seen this painting somewhere from before. And yes, you've seen this blurb said there before. That's how you knew these things. But, but again, because I kept on writing myself, how could it be possible? Because this, that, but the odds of this happening are about, what, 250 million to they're, one. They're more I than I that. My, the odds of yeah, that happening. I remember telling my, The odds of that I, happening? No. They're well, I told way myself more time, than that. I said, you know, the Powerball odds are 250 million to one, but still people win it, don't they? I'm thinking that's all it is. This is one <laughs> wild, wild thing. Because again, you're not ready to accept stuff on. So this is flimsy evidence. Uh, I, but I the mean, nice thing is, yeah, yeah, Robert. Let me ask you: How many art galleries have you been in where you've come across a portrait of a hunchback woman? Yeah, yeah, none. none. I mean, yeah. I mean, seriously. I mean, if you go to, you know, I've been, you know, art galleries all over Europe, uh, the Far East, the United States, and that is not a subject that that you see very often. I mean, Toulouse-Lautrec may have done some of it, but outside of that, not at all. Exactly. And that, but I'm telling myself, I'm trying to figure out what's the odds. But I remember telling myself, well, people win the Powerball, that's 250 billion. That's all this is. This is a bar, bizarre chance thing. But the nice thing is now I had a name. I knew I could go back to Indianapolis and I could research it. And then I'll remember where I see this, where I saw this at. Obviously, this was a small gallery. It's painting. It probably been it's somewhere I'd saw in Indianapolis. And I'd seen this blurb, and that's why I knew those things. But I, I thought, once I get back to Indianapolis, I'll, I'll, I'll get do some research. So I did. I went back to Indianapolis, immediately went to the library, and I found that there was absolutely very, very little information about back with. I mean, he it turned out he wasn't a famous painter. He never painted any masterpiece paintings you'd recognize. Most of his life, he, he, he painted portraits because he could sell those and make money. He painted other things, but he really couldn't sell them. He really had very much luck painting landscapes and selling them. But he could always make money painting portraits. So 
Anyway, so I go to the public library, and I didn't, didn't have very much at all. And the lady there said, you need to go to the Art Museum Library. They have a much more extensive art history library up there at the art, at the art Museum. So I did. I went to the art museum, and the library in there was very nice. She kind of she helped me, and she found she found a bit, maybe a half page total of stuff I'm back with. And the interesting part is everything I found was another confirmation of what I'd seen. This was starting to bug me a little bit. For example, I uh, I found a back with I, I said when I went over the went through the roof after I died that it looked like it was fall. Well, he died in October, and I said that I, I, when I went out went to the roof there was lights to the horizons. Well, he died in New York City. And also said some quotes there from him. Said he didn't like that he painted portraits, but didn't like he didn't like painting portraits. But he did it because he needed the money. He didn't like painting portraits, but he he needed the money. And also said that his portrait, his paintings were full of sun and bright color. And I remember the one over the fireplace that had a bottle and fruit and a big sun in the background. And this now this started bugging me again. I'm again I'm thinking I've worked by I seen this exhibit. I, she a little so late told me said by the way so I have a folder from an exhibition of Beckwith's work that was held right here in Indianapolis. That moment, it was like, oh my God, I finally figured it out. Now I got it figured out. I saw it during this exhibition. So she brought the folder to me. Unfortunately, the exhibition took place in 1911. And I said, there have been, I said, I told her, there's no more exhibitions, more recent ones. She says, no, she says, come on. She said, he wasn't that good a painter. I said, and there's not that much interest in his work. He's not that much of a painter. But interesting enough, on one of the little uh, bits of information she found come from a book, and it was a footnote, and it said this information come from the diaries of J. Carol Beckwith that are on file at the National Academy of Design in New York City. So I knew then, as a police tech, I knew exactly, exactly what yeah. I had to do next. Yeah. I had to get these diaries. I thought, this, this is it. So I went home, and I got a contact. I contacted National Academy of Design in New York City and asked them about the diaries. I'd like to, I'd like to see them. Could I, could it possibly to view the diaries? Mm -hmm. They said, oh, no. No, they're too much too fragile. They said, we don't allow them ever to go out. They said, however, they have been microfilmed, and you get copies of microfilm from the archives of American yeah. Art at the Smithsonian. So I, I went back to the library, and I requested yeah. the library trans transfer the information. I wanted to get the, yeah. the, trans the, the, the uh, microfilm of his uh, diaries. So I ordered them, and the, the, the librarian said it would be about two weeks. So I, when I did it before, before they came in, I thought, I need to do something. I sat down and listened to my tape again. I wrote down everything I'd said during the regression of Beckwith that could be proved or disproved. And I found there were 28 things I had said or experienced during a time that could be proved or not proved. So about well, two weeks this, later, the light break. Excuse well, me. Yeah. This, this is this for me. And, you know, I, we only have a couple of minutes left. But if people read your book and then they go and do a little bit about what you said today, and they're going to see the picture of that hunchback woman. And when they see that picture, they're going to know that it's not your average picture. It is very unique, right? I mean, when you say hunchback, yeah. you think of the hunchback in Notre Dame. That's not this picture. And for yeah. you to have that kind of visualization of a picture that is uncommon to the way hunchback gets described, I'm telling you, if I'm you, I'm shocked. Um, I know we've got short time and I just want to thank you so much for joining us here, but I want people to know how do they get your books? How do they find out about you, Bob? It's available on Amazon. Uh, mm -hmm. any, any, it's available on the internet. Let me just say one last point. Sure. I, when Beckwith, I got the diaries from Beckwith, it turned out there were 17,000 pages. He had kept a diary from age 19 to the day before he died in six, at 65. And I was able through the diaries to prove every, all tw all 28 facts, every single one, every single one of the facts I had seen during the aggression, I was able to prove through the diaries. Yeah. And that, and I, and that, that was a, they say, an awakening moment when I got, when I found I couldn't yeah. find one fact, one fact of things I'd said or seen that wasn't true. That to me, that was, I don't know, that was a revelation that's, to me. That's yeah, and, and, you know, I want to tell everybody they can find a, a synopsis of this, what you've said with images, if they go to reincarnationresearch.com, because there, when I went and I looked, I, I had not heard your description of it. These are not normal images that you could kind of make up and think I saw that. Robert, thank you so much, Mark. 
We will be back next week, and uh, we'll be taking calls from listeners. I'm the psychic. I'm here with the doc. I want to thank our special guest, Robert Snow, reincarnation expert and experiencer. Yep. And we will see you next yeah. week. Same transformation network time, same transformation network channel. Thank you, everybody. God yep. bless. And don't forget, Google Robert Snow. You will get everything, including a video. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to The Psychic in the Dark with Mark Anthony and me, Dr. Pat Basile, right here on TransformationTalkRadio.com. Hey, look, come back next week so we can explore with you more of life's many challenges and learn from fascinating guests. And you know what? even Mark and me. We'll connect you and discover insights from people in this life and from the afterlife. Extraordinary problems? Yeah, they do. They require extraordinary solutions, but step into the world of possibilities with us on The Psychic and the Doc. That's every Thursday, 4 p.m. Pacific Time, 7 p.m. Eastern Time, right here on TransformationTalkRadio.com. That's TransformationTalkRadio.com. And don't forget, we're also live face-to-face -face on Facebook.com, Transformation Talk Radio. <laughs>